celebrating in the church the 11th Sunday after Pentecost. And this Mass is an ancient Mass, the texts, the antiphons, the readings, the prayers, and it's filled with many themes. We could, if we wanted to, uh, preach about resurrection, because the epistle in 1 Corinthians, St. Paul talks about the suffering, the crucifixion, and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead. So that could be a good theme to preach on today. We could also preach on the theme of prayer because the collect of today's mass speaks about the power of prayer. Actually, let me read it to you. Sometimes we uh, we hear these prayer texts and they kind of disappear on us. They go in one ear and not the other. But if you listen to this text, it says, Omnipotent Sempiterum in Deus, Almighty and everlasting God, whose abundant goodness, O oh God, your goodness exceeds all that your suppliants can desire or deserve. Wow. The prayer starts by saying, O oh God, whose goodness is even greater than anything I desire or anything that I deserve. Pour out your mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, of which our consciences are, are afraid. Have you ever noticed that when we sin, our consciences become weird, they become frightened? And we're almost scared to mention the sin even in confession. Although we should never be afraid to confess our sins. But we become, in a sense, ashamed. In any case, and add on to us what we dare not ask. And give to us, O oh God, what we dare not ask. So we could spend this Mass preaching just on that prayer text of the calling. O oh God, your mercy is bigger than anything I desire or expect. And sin has seared my conscience in your mercy clean me and give me even more than I dare to ask. God desires to give us more than we even dare to ask. So we can preach on prayer, but we're not going to do that this morning. We can also go to the gospel and we can begin to preach on sacraments. Because this particular gospel is known as the Ephetha. As a matter of fact, many of the fathers of the church and uh, liturgical commentators through the ages referred to this Sunday as a Fethetha Sunday. A Fethetha means be thou open. So we could talk about sacramentals. Many people accuse us Catholics of ritual. They say God was not impressed with ritual. And they even try to accuse us of magic. Nothing could be further from the truth. Our blessed Lord, when he became one of us, became one of us. St. Augustine says, God decided to, to love humanity in a human way, and he becomes flesh. God becomes flesh in Jesus Christ, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And redeeming us, he redeems us in the flesh. He suffers, he bleeds, he dies upon the cross. But you see today that when he begins to heal a man who is a deaf mute, can't hear, he can't speak, what does our Lord do? He takes him aside, he touches him, he prays, and then he does rituals and ceremonies. We might call them sacramentals. He sticks his fingers into the man's ears. be thou open. And then he puts spittle on his hand and touches the tongue and says, Ephetha, be thou open. And the man's hearing is restored, <coughs> and his speaking is restored. So we could preach a whole sermon just on sacramentals, and how our Lord himself gives us rituals and ceremonies. See, our Lord didn't need to do any of that, did he? Our blessed Lord, all he needed to do was look at him and nod his head, and that man would have been healed. But our Lord says prayers, he goes through rituals. But I'm not going to preach on that either. So we'd be here all day if we spent all the things we could speak on. What I'd like to speak on generally is baptism. 
because the epistle, which speaks of resurrection, is really pointing us into the area of the sacrament of baptism. And the collect that I went through just before with you opens us up to baptism. O oh God, whose abundant goodness exceeds all that your supplicants can desire or deserve, pour out your mercy upon us. St. Paul says a little while later in the epistle that I am the least of men. I am not worthy to be an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by God's grace, I am what I am. Baptism is the first sacrament that we receive. You know as well as I do that baptism, in the rite of baptism and the reality of the sacrament, it washes away original sin. It literally unstops our ears, it loosens our tongues, and it makes us true sons and true daughters of Almighty God. We become true citizens of the kingdom of God at the moment of our baptism. And it's done because God's mercy is greater than anything we can desire or deserve. And if you will recall the traditional rite of baptism, at a certain point, the priest takes his fingers and touches the ears of the infant and says, Efafeta, Efafeta, be open. And then the priest touches the mouth of the baby and says, Efafeta, be open. And a little while, the little bit of salt on the tub, which is to be a symbol of the gospel, the morsel of food that is our salvation. So think for a moment with me about the grace that we have in being baptized. As St. Paul says, our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, when he took our nature upon himself, loves us as a man, the man God. And he suffers for us, he dies upon the cross, and he goes down into the tomb. In baptism, we go down into the tomb with him. And as he raised, is raised from the dead three days later, so too we come out of the tomb as new men and new women. We become the very children of God. St. Paul would say elsewhere, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people called and set apart for God. We are new creatures because of baptism. But St. Paul also warns us, if you hold fast to the gospel that I preach to you, then this will save you. There are many Gospels that are being preached in the world today, aren't there? There's the Gospel of secularism. There's the Gospel of all kinds of strange philosophies. There are, in the church nowadays, many people dressed like I am who are preaching false Gospels, aren't there? Aren't there? And so we must be very cautious and solicitous to make sure that we are standing in the gospel that our Lord Jesus Christ preached. The one by which we are saved. Because no other gospel will free us. No other gospel will save us. All these fake gospels might make us feel good about our sins, but they won't get us to heaven. I could name the names of some of these fake preachers. But I don't think I need to. You're all well-informed people. We have to stand firm in the gospel that the church has proclaimed since the death and the resurrection of our blessed Lord. Now, it's an interesting gospel. It convicts us of sin, and it sets us free if we ask for the mercy of God. In the gospel today, you don't pick up on it unless you study scripture, but there are a lot of things happening. The first thing is, it says that our blessed Lord and his apostles went into the district of Tyre and came by the way of Sidon into the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the district of Decapolis. If you have ever been to uh, Israel or the Holy Land, you know that the Decapolis was a series of ten cities or ten small towns. 
It's where the non-Jewish people live. Now the Jews refer to the non-Jews as the Goyim, the impure. And unless any of you have Jewish blood in you, we would also be called the Goyim today by that, the impure. And so they really didn't want the Goyim living next to Jews in their cities. And so the Goyim, the non-Jewish people, settled in the Decapolis. So there were Greek citizens, there were Roman citizens, all those kinds of people. No Jew would go to the Decapolis unless he absolutely had to. Because you'd be with the Goyim, the impure, the non-Jewish, the non-believers. What does our blessed Lord do? He walks right through the Decapolis. That's radical. That's why the Jews would refer to our Lord as a heretic. Because he was not bound by the color of the skin. He was not bound by the race. He is the Son of God, and he proclaims the gospel to all who will believe. Now, not only does he do that, but he comes up to a man in the Decapolis. We don't know if the man was Jewish or if he was Goyim, impure. Most likely he was non-Jewish. He comes up to our Lord and says, what do he could have dismissed it immediately. That's what a good and righteous Jewish person would do. But instead, he takes him aside. He touches him. You know that when our Lord touched that man, our Lord became ritually impure in the eyes of the Jews. He took him aside. He prayed with him. To the Jew, that would be shocking. How can you pray with a Goyim? You're teaching him our prayer. And then he puts his hands in his ears and his tongue, and he changes the man. He loosens him. Literally, the, the fathers of the church say, this is a sign of what baptism does for you and me. Most of us are not born into Jews. And yet our blessed Lord establishes the church, which is the new Jerusalem. It's the new Israel. And it's open to you and to me. And when we get baptized, we are grafted on to Israel. We become true citizens of Israel. We become the new Jewish race. And we are transformed. And we are changed. But, as St. Paul warns us, if you hold fast to this gospel, then you're going to be saved unless you have believed to no purpose. Sometimes we Catholics, without realizing it, believe to no purpose. When we hear the word of God, but we don't act it out, we believe it to no purpose. When we are baptized and we let our baptisms dormant, we're believing to no purpose. It's almost death. And so we are called instead to keep ourselves in a state of grace. When I am baptized, I become a new person in Christ. I am his son, or you are his daughter, in Christ. We become citizens of the kingdom of God, and proof of that is the church right here on earth. The church is called to be heaven on earth, and should be. But I'm called to live out my baptism. How do I do that? Well, I live out my baptism by developing my faith in Christ, by availing myself to the sacraments, the other sacraments, to receive grace, being humble enough when I sin to confess my sins and have them forgiven. I live out my baptism every time I receive the Holy Eucharist because I receive the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha, the Omega, the everything. He is the love of God, the Father made flesh on earth. But when I receive him in the Holy Eucharist, because I'm baptized, I grow. In holiness, I grow in faith, I grow in peace. Another way that we are called to live our baptisms is the way we vote. Remember, there's a biblical principle that says you cannot be at peace with God and at enmity with God at the same time. So you cannot claim to be a Catholic Christian and to vote for governments or authorities that contradict the law of God. We have power in our voting. 
We have the right, by virtue of our baptism, to boldly stand up for what is true in the gospel. Another way that we can live out our baptism is by the way we treat one another. We call it charity, caritas. I'll be honest with you, living in a monastery, it may look like heaven on earth, but it's not. Sometimes it's pretty hard. I won't say why. Teach me. So you have to go out of your way to practice charity. There are times when I want to throw my bravery at somebody. My prayer book, because the way they were saying your birth, that Heavenly Father was that person. So we do that. When we bless each other, we are practicing our baptism. Those of you who are married, when you love your spouse, in spite of their shortcomings, you are practicing the power of your baptism. Another way we practice our baptism is to stand up for the faith of the church. In these times, there is confusion in the mystical body of Christ, isn't there? Sometimes we don't know what to believe because we hear one priest saying this, another priest saying that, sometimes even bishops, I'm not going to mention names. Well, we have the power of our baptism to know the faith of the church, the catechism, the scripture, the liturgy, the saints, and to defend them with a holy boldness, with a holy boldness. Remember the story of St. Catherine of Siena, huh? At the time, there was another mess in the church back then, and the Pope had moved direction, three popes at the time, nobody knew it was a real Pope. The Pope, the true Pope, the one who thinks was the right Pope, moved to Avignon, and there was corruption in the church, and there was all these cardinals and bishops not saying a word. Does that sound familiar, incidentally? Not saying a word. But this simple, simple Catholic woman, Catherine Siena, she's a third order Dominican. She goes all the way to Avignon and gets in before the Pope and says, get off that chair and go back to Rome where you belong. The church is a mess. Can you imagine? That's holy boldness. We need to practice that in our baptisms. In our baptism. We call on the power of our baptism to stand up. Remember, in all the crises in the church, it tends to be the laity who saved the day. So that's what these readings are about. When we pray, we are a priestly people when we pray. So we're called to pray. Pray for the Pope, pray for the bishops, pray for the cardinals. We have many weak men. Pray for your priests. Pray for your government in this country. Pray for the media. Oh, we could do a bread and water fast for that. But you are a priestly people because of your baptism. But when you pray, you are going to change the world. A people called and set apart. We are not to think the way the world thinks. And yet we so often do, don't we? We're called to think differently and to be entertained differently. And how many of us turn on all of the gadgets that are in the world? In the power of our baptism, we are called to be a different people altogether. There's more that I want to say, but I know I've talked on that. So, this morning, what I want you to think of is this. Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ became flesh for you. If you were the only person that ever met, he would still have become flesh for you. And loved you and suffered for you and died on the cross and rose from the dead. But the abundance of his mercy is greater than what we can ask for. And so he's established the church. And regardless of your race or mine or our backgrounds, we are members of the church by virtue of our baptism. Original sin is washed away. We are sons and daughters of God. We are called to act like sons and daughters of God. So this week, what I want you to do is just give thanks for your baptism. <clears throat> How often do you get up in the morning and say, Oh God, I give you thanks for the gift of my Catholic faith. Start doing it. Thank God for your faith. Thank God for your baptism this week. And let's be fully and bold in our baptisms. Practice charity towards one another. 
practice of boldness in the way we make decisions or the entertainment that we're going to watch or the way we vote. Practice of boldness that if you hear anyone, even a priest or a bishop, saying something that's not of the faith, confront them with a holy boldness. And I promise you that if we do that, by this time next week, the church will be holier because of your prayer and your boldness. May God make us holy and bold in our baptisms, and may we truly manifest God's kingdom in the church, in our families, and in the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.